So education in the nature of mind. Or education in the nature of intelligence. And why is that so important? Well, it's important because we've had a certain kind of education in the way that our mind works. We've had a certain kind of education in what the nature of reality is. We've had a certain kind of education in who we are, in what our identity is, what we're capable of, how we can relate to ourselves and other people. And it can be quite powerful and clarifying to actually look and to take a step back and to see the results of the conventional education you know, in our lives. And when I look at my life and I see the results of the conventional education that I had, and um, I include the education I had in school, but also in a, a far, far broader sense, now, everything that I learned as I grew up, everything I learned as I lived my life as, a, as an adult. And it can be useful to recognize that when we're born, we're not born knowing anything. We're born completely wide open. This intelligence is just completely wide open. You know, we're, we're ready to learn, we want to learn. And if you look at a, a child, you know, they, they want to learn, they're open, they're taking everything in. And so we take everything in, we see what's going on, uh, on around us, and this is how we learn. And so we slowly learn to identify ourselves. We slowly learn to build up this image and this picture of who we are. And then we build up this picture and this image of reality, based on what everybody else around us is doing, on their ideas, on their definitions, on their descriptions of what's going on. And this is very normal, you know, how else would we find out what, what's going on? But to look at the results of this conventional education and to look at it very clearly and see, well, what, what did this lead to? And what, what, what has this led to for me personally? And then what has this led to for us as a society, as a species on this planet? And so I start with myself and, and look really clearly and see, well, now what, what kind of life did this conventional education lead to? And it's interesting to see that I learned to describe my experience and I learned to categorize my experience in lots of different ways. But there was a fundamental way of understanding what was going on. And that was to categorize my experience into good, bad and indifferent. So I'd be feeling something, I'd be with a group of people perhaps. And there'd be all kinds of data going on. So data are any of the thoughts, emotions, physical sensations, anything we can describe we can just call data. So there'd be all this data going on. This constant scre uh, stream, scream even, <laughs> of descriptions that actually reminds me a little bit of what I'm hearing over here. <laughs> It's this constant commentary <laughs> on everything that's going on. And sometimes it would get louder and sometimes it would seem to be a bit softer. But it would be this stream of descriptions about what's going on. What do they think? What are they saying? How do I feel now? You know, I, I, you know am I doing all right here? Am I doing all right here? Yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Oh no, I said something wrong there. And <laughs> just this stream of descriptions and, and then really you know life was, um, was was really tense and difficult because I had to pay attention <laughs> to all of it <laughs> and there was a lot of it and um, so it meant that the whole time I was kind of just just on edge you know really constantly checking in with everything that was going on and all of these ways of describing um, good bad and indifferent were, were often in reference to ideas I had about how I should be feeling and certain sets of descriptions that I'd learned that I should be feeling, so I should be feeling happy and I shouldn't be feeling nervous or sad and so when I felt happy that was okay, everything was alright, but then I had to continually 
keep checking in. Am I still happy? Am I still doing all right? Or is there something else that I'm feeling now? And then when that happiness wasn't there, or there was a description that I'd learned to label as negative, like sadness or nervousness or loneliness, then I had to look into that, work out what the cause was, try and adjust the circumstances, you know, go and be with a different group of people, or go and be on my own. Maybe that, that would help to bring about the happiness again. And it was this constant doing, constant working at what was going on. And um, then when I look at the results of this approach, I can see that I was able to bring about happiness and um, had some great times, but, but none of it lasted. The loneliness, the sadness, the commentary would always come back. No, no matter how hard I worked, no matter how brilliant I got at working out what it was that made me happy and what it was that I thought made me sad, I couldn't control this flow of data. And I, I did my best. And I really did my best. I put all my time and energy into this, crafting a, a beautiful life. And um, it, it was great actually to completely explore this way of living and to see that no matter how hard I tried, no matter how amazing my circumstances, there was never really what I was looking for, which was this sense of complete ease, this sense of knowing exactly what the purpose and meaning of my life was, this sense of confidence in knowing that what I had to contribute, I could contribute with an open heart. I never found that in all of the strange and diverse places and activities that I looked. And worse than that sometimes was the competition with other people, comparing myself with other people. And it was just exhausting, completely exhausting. Again, this commentary of, you know, looking at other people, thinking about, you know, either how brilliant other people were or what idiots other people were. And it would just sw switch the whole time. And then it'd be, you know, how brilliant I am and, you know, I know much more than everybody else. And then the next moment, I'd just be completely lost and be the worst loser that had ever lived. And nothing had changed. And the circumstances were the same. But my descriptions, my flow of data was continually changing. And practically with the way that I live my life in terms of um, things like smoking, this is a brilliant example of the effects of living my life emphasizing all of my descriptions about myself and what all of my experiences and sensations mean. And um, it applies to anything that seems to be habitual. And so what I saw really clearly going through the empowerments, one of the foundation trainings here, was that everything, absolutely everything that I could describe all of the ideas I had about myself, all of the ideas I had about other people, all of the ideas I had about the nature of reality, were data shining forth equally from open intelligence. So all of them were known by exactly the same opening intelligence. There wasn't anything that I could find that had an independent nature from this opening intelligence. And the way to check that out was through taking short moments repeated many times whenever I naturally remembered. So each time I took a short moment, I allowed the data to be exactly as it was, whatever it was, and looked for myself to see whether open intelligence was at the basis and was inseparable from this particular datum or description or feeling or thought or emotion. And this is the way that I discovered for myself that nothing could be found to have an independent nature. But what's key in this training is that we take this intellectual understanding of the indivisible nature of all experience from the basic state of this opening intelligence and apply it directly in our everyday lived experience. This is absolutely key. Now when I began to do this with something like smoking, it was amazing. It was fascinating because first of all I began to have these insights into exactly what I had been telling myself. What these ideas were that I had adopted 
and then reinforced by telling myself again and again and again. So the education of the way that I'd reinforce these ideas of short moments of telling myself, I'm a smoker, I like to smoke, I really enjoy everything about smoking, I wish I could give up smoking, I hate smoking, smoking's killing me. All of these ideas, all of these descriptions were also data shining forth from open intelligence. Now just that insight alone was very, very powerful because I began to see this basic mechanism and with something like smoking, the results of this mechanism in my life, believing that this data had power over me, it defined who I was and, and compelled my action. It was because I'd been telling myself these things for so long that I really believed they were true. I believed they had this independent nature. I believed they had this power over me. So first of all, the insight was really powerful, just to see that all of this was data. But then, to apply short moments directly in the process, all of the process of smoking. So the first thing that arises is the craving the thought, I really, I really want to have a cigarette now. Apply a short moment there. See what really is that craving. Does it have an independent nature? Allow it to be there. Allow it to be exactly as it is, just for a short moment. Now, in all of my years of telling myself that I was a smoker, I had never done that. Never, ever. In all of the 23 years that I was a really committed smoker, I'd never allowed the craving just to be as it was, even for a short moment. I'd always had to do something about it. And that doing had often been to actually have a cigarette, have a smoke. But it had also been the exact opposite, trying to push away that craving, trying to distract myself with something else, replacing that craving with another thought or it had been avoiding situations where I knew that craving would come up, avoiding being with people who I knew were smokers, and avoiding that situation completely. And to allow myself to feel that craving from a place of complete openness, without moving from that openness just for a short moment, for me was incredible, because it blew open exactly what that craving was. It was this dynamic energy. And when I left it as it was, it was nothing but that dynamic energy. Then when you smoke, also apply a short moment. In the process of actually smoking, the relief, the temporary relief that you might feel for a few seconds, but apply short moments there, see what that relief is. Is that data too? Is open intelligence also the basis of that description? And then once you finish smoking, once the revulsion and the guilt and the horror <laughs> arise, take a short moment there. Are all of these things also data shining forth from open intelligence? Check it, but really check it out. Having it as an idea or a concept will be of no benefit at all. Absolutely none. It has to be your direct instinctive recognition in the direct encounter with all of your data. And with these habitual things, these things that we've been telling ourselves for maybe decades, this is where there's so much potency. Because to recognize that these two are this powerful display of dynamic beneficial energy is incredible because there's so much power there. To redefine ourselves as this completely wide open knowledge and benefit creator and to demonstrate that in each moment by allowing the data to be exactly as they are gives us the power to say no. To be really clear with ourselves about what will be of most benefit to all, including ourselves. So it gave me the power to say no, I'm not going to smoke. I'm not interested in that anymore. I don't want to define myself in that way anymore. It's primitive. No interest in that anymore. Just seeing everything completely clearly and seeing that I have the power to say no. So powerful to take command of your life in that way. 
know, so loving, so gentle, but completely uncontrived, not in some forced way, but in that direct encounter with everything about yourselves, exactly as you are, allowing yourself to be exactly as you are. So kind to live like that. This is the way that we give up the competition with ourselves and with everybody else. One short moment at a time. If you think you have prolonged states, how do you recognize open intelligence in the midst of all of those descriptions? One short moment at a time. Apply the Four Mainstays algorithm to your life. Take advantage of the support. If things seem challenging, contact your trainer, participate in a training, listen to the free media on the website. All of it there will give you the power to decide exactly how you want to live your life. You give up the right to be a victim and you empower yourself with your beneficial potency. One short moment at a time. One talk at a time. One training at a time. Completely accessible. Everything laid out for you. But it's up to you to decide if this is something you want to take advantage of. And I know for me it's um, yeah, it's just been the most incredible thing that I've ever come across in my life. You know, the changes that I've seen in myself, the empowerment of myself, just continues to increase and increase and increase. The obviousness of the stability that I was always looking for, the sense of ease, the sense of openness, the sense of being able to contribute, everything that I knew I had to contribute continues to increase. So thank you all for being here, thank you for your openness, for listening, and yeah, just keep showing up. If you're new and you haven't understood a, a, or understood very little of what's been shared, just keep showing up. Check it out for a little while. Now see what the results are for you, because that's the only way that you'll know about the efficacy of what's being suggested here. <coughs>